tired of the everyday routine. Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you... Escape! Escape! Transcribed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. You are standing in a lonely canyon in the shadows of Superstition Mountain. While facing you, tempers ragged, guns drawn, are three men who at your first move toward hidden treasure will kill you. Today, with Paul Dubov, starred as Pascal, we escape to the Arizona desert and a lost treasure of a million dollars, as Ralph Bates told it in his most unusual story, When the Man Comes, Follow Him. I know that now. But what good's it do? How could you tell dead men that it's all your fault and you're sorry? No matter what you tell them, they're still dead. So what's the use? It never would have happened if we hadn't got mixed up in this superstition business. We was going along fine. All the other boys in Res- Frisco respected us. Stayed out of our territory, at least most of the time. That was on account of the boss, Mr. Heineman. He was too smart for them, and they knew it. Smart and a great guy along with it. Of course, some people might call him an ordinary racketeer, but he wasn't like that. Nobody could have treated me no better. And he was cultured, too. Loved music. Played a violin almost as good as this fellow, uh, Heifetz, or whatever his name is. Why, one time he sent me clear to New York to pick up a Stradivarius he'd heard about. And I had to hang around the dealer's store for two weeks before I got a chance to lift it. He wouldn't have trusted a job like that to any of the rest of the boys. He trusted me more than any of them. Me. Pascal. That's how come I feel so bad about what's happened. Because he trusted me. And he had to trust somebody, you understand. Because for 15 years, the boss had been stone blind. Come on, Pascal. Eyes, man. Give me eyes. But it's foggy down there, boss. I can't see the bay at all, just the end of the bridge. And out toward the Golden Gate, there's nothing but just fog. I guess it's going to rain. What about the street below us, Pascal? What's going on down there? Nothing. Just streetcars and taxis going up and down and a few people. Not very many. I tell you, boss, there's nothing doing at all. It's a very dull day. All right, forget it. You can come away from the window. Why don't you play the violin a while? No, not today. I'm too restless. Something is going to happen, I think. Happen? What's going to happen? I don't know. Something. Are any of the boys here? Brian and Daly in the next apartment playing Jim Rummy. You want I should call him? No. I wonder if you know what it's like, Pascal, to live always in pitch darkness, depending on somebody else to tell you what's going on around you. Ah, forget it, boss. You got me. I'm the eyes, you're the brain. We're doing all right. Maybe, only sometimes I wonder... I'll get it, boss. I'll get it. Mr. Heinemann's apartment. Who? Well, I'm not sure whether Mr. Heinemann... Who is it? Oh, I see. All right, thanks. That was the manager. Your brother's here from Phoenix. Mark? He's downstairs? Yeah. He's on his way up. The manager couldn't stop him. He says he looks like he's in pretty bad shape. Ever see a desert rat that didn't? No. Well, so I'm to be honored by a visit from my sanctimonious brother. I wonder what he wants. Oh, money, as usual. Three or four hundred dollars to finance another six months of prospecting, and he'll repay it by telling me what an evil man I am. I wouldn't give it to him, boss. Why not? As long as it keeps him over there on the Arizona desert for most of the year, I can stand one or two visits from him. You can hear the elevator stopping. Better open the door. I still say you ought to crack down on him. Open the door. Uh, Hello, Mark. Help. Come in. Boss, he's heard of something. What is it? Eyes, Pascal. Quick. Hasn't shaved for four or five days. He's weak, trembling. Holding on to the door frame with his right hand, holding his chest with the other hand. I think he's been shot, boss. Yes. Shot. Come here. Help me. Take it easy. Take it easy. Here, I'll help you. Come on. Uh, Over on the couch. Okay. Uh, Come on. Here we are, boss. Uh, Easy now. Uh, There. What happened, Mark? I had to get here. I want you to have it. So he can't. He's out of his head. Get Brian and Daly over here. Brian knows a lot about gunshot wounds. All right, boss. You. What happened, Mark? Who shot you? Shot. Connect me with 907. I have to get here. Hello, Brian. All the 
Michael, it is this. Right away. All right. Fools. Oh, fools. Treasures of kings and princes. Die. Mark, you've got to get hold of yourself. Die. Die. Have to get here. You get it instead of him. Watch out for him. Oh, Mark. Map. Old map and the new map. He doesn't even make sense. Quiet. Look. Look. Eyes, right, Pascal, what's he doing? He's Look. raised up a little. He's pointing with his finger at the carpet about four feet away. When you get there, watch for it. When the man comes, follow him. Understand? Sure, Mark. When the man comes, follow him. Yes. When the man comes, follow him. What's he mean? Oh, no. Follow him. What's up, boss? That guy said you wanted me. Come in, Brian. This is my brother. He's been shot. See what you can do for him. Yeah. Let's have a look. I've got to think. I've got to think. What could he possibly have stumbled into? Yeah, this happened a couple of days ago, at least. Should have had a doctor right away. He wanted to get here for some reason. But why? His daily boss. Well, what's coming off in here? You're not cooking up something and leaving little Daly out of it. Ain't I in this, Mom? Stop your barking, Daly, before I throw you a can of strong hut. Don't get so smart now, Pascal. I got as much right to talk around here as you have. I said shut up. Uh, the boss's brother is here. He's been shot. He's in bad shape. Yeah. You're not kidding, Pascal. Matter of fact, he's about in as bad shape as he'll ever be. Boss. He's dead. That was the start of the thing. When the doc came, he said Mark should have died 24 hours earlier. Said he stayed alive long enough to get to Frisco on sheer nerve, nothing else. Mr. Heinemann, he don't say much. He let the doctor take charge of everything. There was a wallet and some other stuff in Mark's pockets. Mr. Heinemann, he took it with him and went into his own room and stayed there. After a while, the other boys drifted back to their rummy game, and finally about 10 o'clock, I went to bed. At two in the morning, I woke up to find Heinemann shaking my arm. Pascal, can you hear me? Uh, Pascal, come on, come on, wake up. Okay, boss. I'm awake. What's the matter? I've been thinking. Got some ideas I'd like to talk about. All right, I'm listening. It's about Mark, the things he said. They begin to make sense. Well, maybe to you, but not to me. Look, is this what I think it is? Oh, wait a minute, boss. Let me get some light. Look. Uh, Yeah, it's, uh, it's a map of a mountain range, I think. There's a lot of wavy lines like they use for valleys and ridges. There's some faded writing on it. Brown ink. I think it's pretty old. Sixty or seventy years at least, uh, judging by that feel of the paper. Go on, Pascal. Describe it to me. Well, what looks like a road runs across the bottom along the base of the mountains. And there's a spot on it marked Red Hill. And there's a wavy line starts there and runs about uh, halfway up the map. It runs past some dots marked Three Trees. And off on one side is a little drawn of a shovel with a broken handle. And it ends at another spot marked uh, camp. It's probably a trail. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Uh, well, a camp is beside a line that looks like the edge of a ridge or a cliff. And, and there's some writing that says, If no answer, go down. Hmm. If no answer, go down. What else? Well, about a third of the way to the left from the camp, there's an X mark, and it says, Man lives here. I thought the top there's another X. That's marked uh, Thunder Peak. And at the very top, there's the word superstition. I guess that's about all. Good. Later, I'll have you take my finger and trace over the whole thing until I know it by heart. But this is enough to start on. To start what on? A search for whatever caused my brother's death. Something rather valuable, if my thinking is correct. All right. Only, uh, how do we go about finding it? Mark told us how. When the man comes, follow him. You know what it means? Not yet. Well, if the map's 60 years old or more, how do you figure this guy's going to be there? Because my brother found him and followed him and then died for it. We're going to follow him, too. You and I and Bryant and Daly. We're going to Phoenix. Boss, uh, I think maybe it's a kind of mistake to take Daly along. Why? Well, because he's a double-crosser. That's why I've been trying to tell you you can't trust him. Don't worry. I can handle him. He's not the one who has to be watched. Then who is? Bryant? Let's leave it for now. Call the ticket office and get four reservations on the next plane out. I've got the feeling we'd better move fast. By the next afternoon, we checked in at a hotel westward Ho in Phoenix. 
and started trying to get a line on Mark Heinemann's recent activities. After two days, we still didn't have much to go on. He'd apparently hooked up with some new partner about six months before and gone into the desert. No one had seen anything of him since. An old man who ran a hardware store where Mark had bought tools and supplies finally gave us the tip-off without knowing it. Uh, you see, Mr. Heinemann, your brother was one of the fellows around here who believed in the legend of the lost Dutchman mine. I figured that's what he was really prospecting for. But what is the lost Dutchman mine? Well, it's supposed to be a deposit of gold. Richer than any's ever been found. A real treasure of kings. Treasure of kings? Boss, that's what he said. Uh, according to the stories, there's supposed to be a map in existence uh, somewhere showing the exact location of the mine drawn by the Dutchman himself. Uh, during the last 50 years or so, a lot of prospectors have gone back into the superstitions looking for it, but none what of them... What do you mean by superstitions? Well, superstition mountains. Out on the desert, east of the town. That's where the mine's supposed to be located. Why are they called superstitions? Yes, because so many fellows have gone up into them and never come back. There's supposed to be an Apache curse on anybody who goes in there. The range used to be sacred to the Indian god of thunder. I see. And why do you think these men never came back? Uh, heat, thirst, got lost, snake bite. Oh, it's awful rough country, and there's no water. Then, too, there, there, there might be a kind of curse on the place at that. The double cross. Meaning? Well, blazing sun and a lust for gold can be a bad combination on a man's nerves. A lot of partners have come back out of those hills alone. Double cross, huh? Yeah. At least that's one curse that isn't limited to the superstitions. you find it in a lot of places. Well, we better go. Many thanks for your information. Well, not at all, Mr. Heinemann. Sorry, I couldn't be of more help. So that's what Mark found, a gold mine. A rich one, maybe? It must be. Mark was dying and he knew it, and yet all he talked about was treasure of kings. Gold, in other words. He didn't even tell us who shot him. Maybe his partner did it. Maybe. Pascal. Yeah? I want you to buy a pair of binoculars and rent a car. Uh -huh. We're going to drive out and try to locate that red hill this afternoon. All right, boss. The one thing we've got to watch out for is that curse. That's what happened to Mark. Yeah, it's only an Indian superstition. I'm talking about the double cross. Mark wasn't the first man to die from it, and I don't think he'll be the last. Here, Pascal, let me take your arm. I rented an ash sedan from the garage at the hotel, and we headed out across the desert east of town. It was late afternoon before we finally found it. The only red hill on the east slope of the superstitions. Mr. Heinemann told me to take the binoculars and try to locate the three trees that were marked on the map. I left the car, worked my way around the far side of the hill and almost to the top before I could see the trees standing close together on the shoulder of the ridge about six miles away. Just the way they were shown on Mark Heinemann's map. I stared up at the pale blue peaks in the distance, watched the lightning flashes from near the tops of them and... Shivered a little. Finally, I turned and started back to the road. Dusk had fallen fast like it does in the desert, and it was nearly dark when I reached the car and opened the door. Mr. Heinemann was slumped over in the seat with blood running from a cut in his forehead. He was unconscious. just a moment, we will return to Escape. But first, Ozzie and Harriet are back on CBS, coming to you on most of these same stations every Sunday evening, just before the Jack Benny Show. You'll find them more delightful, more welcome than ever. Ozzie and Harriet's own two boys, Ricky and David, are now playing themselves in the CBS series. So make it a family party with Ozzie and Harriet tomorrow night. And now with our star, Paul Duvob, as Pascal, and with Herb Butterfield as Mr. Heineman, we return to the second act of Escape and... When the Man Comes, Follow Him. <laughs> boss. Boss, come on, now wake up. You're not hurt that. Huh? It's only a little cut in your scalp. Come on. Come on, boss. Come on, Pascal. Yeah, 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 it's me. I'm here with you now. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Pascal. 
Did you see him? No, no, I didn't see anybody. Who was it? What happened? A man. Talk to the Texas straw. Wearing heavy boots with hobnails. Uh-huh. Came up on the side of the car next to the hill and poked a gun in my face. He knew who I was and that I was blind. He wanted the map. Did he get it? No. I put it under the floor map. Good. I heard him coming. Good. Tried to grab his gun. He slugged me. Started going through my pockets. Uh-huh. Ran off into the rocks when he heard you coming. Well, it's dark up there now. No good trying to follow him. Oh, never mind. I know who he is. Oh, did he tell you? No, but it fits together. Mark had a partner. This guy? Sure. Who else could he be? Then this is the guy who shot Mark. I think so. I imagine there was a double cross and he got even, but... Wait. No, of course not. What's the matter, boss? Oh, what a fool I've been. What do you mean? I had it figured all along that Mark double-crossed his partner and got shot for it. It was the other way round. Oh. It was Mark's man. And this partner doesn't know the secret of it. Uh. He probably knows where the man lives, but ten to one he doesn't know about following him. Scott. Yeah, boss? Get the car started and head back for the hotel. We've got to get an outfit together and start up that trail tomorrow morning. There's no time to lose. Let's go. At nine o'clock the next morning, the four of us passed the Red Hill and started up the rocky trail that led toward the far-off heights of Thunder Peak. Brian and Daly each led two mules loaded with food and kegs of water, and I took care of Mr. Heineman. It was already hot, even at that time of morning. And boy, it got hotter. The line drawn on the map followed the crest of a ridge, but there wasn't really any trail. We wound around through tumbled masses of rocks and boulders, climbed over cliffs and gullies, and stumbled across crumbling slopes of debris that slid away beneath our feet and crashed down into the ravine. By noon, we were stopping to rest every ten minutes. Even the rest didn't do no good, because there wasn't any shade. By late afternoon, we'd covered only six miles, and we were done in. None of us had known how hot a desert sun could get. We were ready to turn back or fight one another at the least excuse. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Move here, poor like a devil. Can't hey, wait for you. And this for me. <laughs> What's the matter, Daly? Your tongue's hanging out. Yeah. Let it hang. When I get yeah. back to Frisco, I never want to see the sun again. That's uh, good for you. Not. It'll give you a tan. Get rid of that fish belly San Quentin complexion of yours. How would you like to have a bullet in the stomach, Pascal? Go ahead and draw if you feel lucky. Pascal, Daly, that's enough now. Yeah. Cut it out. Now, Pascal started. I don't care who started. That's enough. We're too close to a million dollars worth of gold to have the whole thing loused up because somebody lost his temper. You said a million dollars? That's right, Brian. According to the story, that's how much the Dutchman is supposed to have dug out of the mine and hidden... Before he was killed by Apaches without ever getting back to bring it out. A million dollars. Boy, what a man could do with a million dollars. Not a million daily. Twenty-five percent of a million. That's the amount of your share, you know. Yes, yeah, sure. <laughs> I know. I, I, I was just thinking. Hey, look. Right ahead of us. We couldn't see him on account of the ridge. Trees! Three trees! Oh, boy, a little shade of sure kept... What's wrong? Eyes, Pascal, what is it? The trees, boss. The ones marked on the map. Only they're dead. Been dead for years, they look like. Yeah. There's not a square foot of shade under all three of them. Well, uh, can't be helped. At least it means we're on the right trail. Well, it's still the easiest way I know to get a million dollars. Let's push on. Two hours later, we came across a shovel with a broken handle stuck on the top of a pile of rocks, so we knew we were still heading in the right direction. The shovel had been drawn on the map. We stopped there for the night. A while at the dock, the boss heard somebody in the rocks, so we put out the fire we'd built and took turns standing guard. And later, when the moon was up, I thought I saw something moving a short way off, but I couldn't be sure. Yeah, it was a creepy feeling, thinking I was being watched, not seeing anybody. All night long, I could see the flares of lightning and hear the low thunder from the top of the shadowy peak ahead of us. Was I glad when dawn finally came and we hit that trail again. But two hours later, I was wishing for sundown again. It was even hotter than the day before. And on top of it, all of us were so stiff and sore we could hardly move. We cursed and sweated and stumbled through the long, blazing day. Finally, at dusk, we reached the spot marked camp on the map. It was close to the edge of a straight-walled cliff that yawned over a deep box canyon below. There were signs of campfires and burrow tracks. This place had been used before. Yeah, we were too tired to care. 
Not even bothering to unsaddle the mules, we drank from one of the kegs and dropped down in the shade of a rock ledge. Not able to move any further. After about an hour, the sun slipped behind the ridges to the west and left us in a shadow. The boss got us onto our feet, put Ryan to search for something to use for a fire, and told Daly to unpack the mules. He took me with him to scout along the rim of the cliff and try to find out what was meant by the words on the map. If no answer, go down. After half an hour, we found nothing. And we were ready to decide there was no way to go down that thousand-foot rock wall when suddenly... Oh, that was a shot. You see anything? No, no. It was back toward camp, but there's a ridge between us. I can't see a sign of any... Come on, Prescott. Yeah. Take hold of my arm. Okay. Let's get back there fast. Who is it? Come on, come on. Speak up or I'll shoot. Relax, Brian. It's us. Mr. Pascal and the boss. Did you see anybody? No. What happened? Ah, somebody took a shot at Daly. He got all spooked up and fired off half a clip. It was that guy that's been following us, boss. I saw a man in the rocks not more than 100 feet away. And you missed him, I suppose. Well, it was dark. Hey, what happened to the mules? They're gone. Yeah, they stampeded when Daly fired off that gun in there. Is. That's great. A fine time packing five kegs of water and all the supplies on our backs. Yeah, well... Boss, we don't have five kegs of water. There's only one here. One? I hadn't unpacked the mules yet, boss. I, I, I was going as soon as it got a little cooler. You fool, you stupid, lazy, blundering fool. That's what I've been telling you, boss. All the brains this dope's got... You shut up, Pascal. One more crack. It's a meal. Daily, I could kill you and love it. I could stand here and pump bullets into you and love it. Do you know how long a man can live up here without water? 24 hours at the most. But we still got five gallons of water. I didn't know they were going to run off. How could oh, I... Shut up. It's done. That's that. Go see if there's any chance of finding them. And try to keep from getting yourself shot. I go with him, Brian. Okay, boss. Come on, smart boy. If you don't yeah. find them in 20 minutes, come on back. Five gallons of water for four men. It'll take us a full day to get down into that canyon and find the spot where the man lives. And another day to get back here, if we're lucky. Then two more days back to the road. I guess we can just barely make it. There's only one thing, boss. There's no way to get down into that canyon. I think I've got the answer there. At least that's one thing that shooting did. Listen. Hello! Hello! Sure. It's an echo. If no answer, go down. Yeah. I think we'll find a spot someplace along the rim of that cliff where there's no echo. When we do, I think there'll be some way to get down to the bottom. We'll try it in the morning. And uh, one other thing, Pascal, before they come back. Yeah, boss? From here on, keep an eye on Bryant. I think that gold is beginning to look pretty big to him. I, I think maybe you're making a mistake. I think Daly's a lot more to, likely to try something. He's a born double-crosser. No. His... He's a fool and a coward. But Bryant's the one who's dangerous. And you do as I tell you. And watch out for him. Do you understand? All right. Sure, boss. Whatever you say. An hour after dawn the next morning, we found a spot on the edge of the cliffs where there was no echo. Slanting downward from it was a narrow, steep crack in the wall. The four of us took turns packing our one last keg of water and inched our way down toward the canyon floor a thousand feet below. We made it finally, rested, then struck out to the west following the map. Great chunks of rock lay tossed about it, though giants had played there, and thorn and cactus grew everywhere among them. The sunlight curled and blistered on the surface of the boulders, and always from above us and nearer now came the sullen and ominous roll of thunder. At noon, we stumbled across the bed of the ravine, nearly missing it from being half-blinded by the heat. And three hours later, we found the place where the man lives. It was marked by a monument bill of broken rocks stacked up higher than our heads. Mr. Heineman felt all over the surface of it with his hands and then told us he knew the meaning of the words, When the man comes, follow him. But he said it wasn't time yet. We'd have to wait. We sat there by the pile of stones, not talking much. Just waiting. Two hours passed. I think it was Daly who noticed it first. Look. Look down on the ground. 
there's somebody here. He, he's behind us. Hit the dirt! <laughs> Boys, I'm a little disappointed in you. Scared by a shadow. Oh, well, Look well, at it. It's the shadow of that pile of rocks. Looks just like a man with a hat on holding a gun. Yeah. The rock pile don't look like a man, but the shadow does. Well, since he's apparently come now, I guess we'd better follow him. Huh? How do you mean follow him? The sun's going down. The shadow must be getting longer, stretching out over the ground. So get going. Follow the direction it's pointing. All yeah, right, boys. Carol will stay here with me and keep you on line. Right, Watch the signs of something buried. Rocks laid over it, a cleared space, something of that kind. Okay. We're not more than a few feet from a million dollars. Let's get it. The two of them worked their way along through the rocks while I stood by the monument and waved them toward one side or the other. Part of the time, they were out of sight behind a ledge of boulder. An army could have hidden in that broken mess and never been noticed. I kept describing everything that was happening to the boss. And about 20 minutes went by before I heard Daly shout. We found it! Go! It's here! We found it! He scrambled over a ledge and came running toward us, calling out and holding something in his hand. Then about 100 feet away from us, he stopped suddenly and drew his gun. That's Cal. What is it? What's happening? Daly's pulled a gun on his boss. Drop it, Daly! Drop it or I'll shoot! No, Ben Cal! He's in between us, you fool! He's hiding in the rock! <laughs> All right, Daly, you asked for it! Hell no! I got him, boss. The dirty double crosser. Fool! He was going to kill us, boss. He was coming at us with a... Wait. Wait, somebody staggered out of the rocks there and fell. Somebody I never saw before. My brother's partner, the man who's been following us. But then Daly killed him and I killed Daly. Boss, I thought Daly was shooting at us. I, I didn't know there was anybody else there. Well, you know now. I told you to keep an eye on Bryant. What's happened to him, Pascal? Where's Bryant? Right behind you, sucker. Look out, boss. How's he shooting, Bryant? Hey! I got him, boss. He missed me. I got him. Good. Only he didn't miss me. Boss. No, 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 boss. That's Can you hear the thunder? Yeah, yeah, sure. It's real loud. That's funny. Same old curse. Double cross. My fault, boss. I should have done like you told me and watched Brian. A million dollars in gold for somebody else. Don't talk like that. It's for us. For us, for you and me. I'll get you out, boss. You're not really hit bad. You're Man, not... I'm dying. And you too, Pascal. What? Well, you're going to die too. What? Well, what do you mean? The we... water keg. Brian's bullet smashed it. I heard the water running out. Huh? No. 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 Am I right? Uh, yeah. It's all gone. It's three days out to the highway, Pascal. And you don't have any water. You poor devil. You don't have one single drop of water. <laughs> Produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Today, we have presented Transcribed. When the Man Comes, Follow Him by Ralph Bates. Adapted for radio by Les Crutchfield. With editorial supervision by John Dunkel. Starred as Pascal was Paul Dubov. With Herb Butterfield as Mr. Heineman. Featured in the cast were Harry Bartell, Jeff Corey, Barney Phillips, and Junius Matthews. Special music was arranged and played by Ivan Dittmar. Next week, you are standing on the rolling deck of a pirate junk in the China Seas. And facing you is the sinister figure of the most feared man in the Orient. A general who has just doomed you to death. <laughs> We escape with an unusual story, The General Died at Dawn by Charles Booth. Be sure to tune in at the same time next week when once again we offer you Escape. It's wonderful, truly amazing, how much you can get from just one radio program. The unbounded passion of the world's greatest Don Juan, the unrivaled music of the world's most eminent soloist, an unsurpassed lesson in philanthropy. Also, some of the greatest laughter you'll ever hear. For the program is the Jack Benny Show. Be sure to hear Jack Benny and his gang again Sunday at 7 o'clock Eastern Time over these same CBS stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Now, stay tuned for five minutes of the latest news to be followed by the Let's Pretend program over most of these stations. <laughs> This is 
CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>